guys great presentation so far. And let me just frame what I've heard in the past uh, hour or so, which is one reflection. It's great to see how from very R&D driven company that we started off as at DSC, uh, we came to this time in our uh, history where we can do cutting edge development with great companies like us who are focusing on things that are going to change how we interact with perception of commercials of ads. Uh, so whatever um, Yash is planning for us in the future, and what we are going to do with you guys, that's going to be amazing. But let me kick off this discussion with one simple question. Krzysztof, can we expect less intrusive and more successful ads in the future that me as a user, as a consumer, I'm going to maybe not suffer from but enjoy? I think so, definitely. I think the form of an intrusive ad that we know generally for media from television, from movies, uh, even from radio, when it just comes on suddenly. Um, that maybe will not go away, but it will, will be, I think, less uh, efficient when compared to other ways, more subtle ways of advertising uh, and more selling you products rather than trying to push a particular message in this particular situation. I think that's the direction we're moving in because that's also what I wanted to highlight uh, in my presentation, that we expect this classical form of advertising to be dominant. And it still works. But obviously the, the market, the reality, and everything is moving towards a slightly different language, different product, and uh, different forms of advertising. But more successful for the brands, right? I would imagine so. More successful for the brands and more directly monetizable perhaps, more tied directly to what you're doing. Think about just easily purchasing a song versus hearing an ad about an album on the radio and then planning a trip to a music store and then going to the store finding the CD or maybe on the way from another one versus just clicking and buying a song from an album. That's the type of difference I think we're looking at. I see. And uh, Kamo, I have this vivid recollection of a movie from the early 2000s called Minority Report <laughs> with Tom Cruise. Good movie. Yes, indeed. Uh, there are a few scenes there that depict what we're trying to build here, maybe I'm mistaken, where you can get and consume targeted ads that also are really focused on the user that is passing by. The technology that we're building, is it the first step in that direction? Well, it is, but the technology is really just a tool that will like, give you uh, possibilities of using it in different ways. You can, you can use the gaze estimation, gaze tracking, maybe not really to, um, uh, to put ads um, in places, but maybe just um, um, make them better. That is, this is the way I see it. If, if, you, if, you, if you present a group of people with an ad, uh, and use uh, uh, eye tracking technology. You can see if they're really interested in that ad, if, if, if that ad, if they're focusing on it, if, you, if they're focusing on the uh, on the things in the ad that you really want them to focus. If, if that's not the case, change the ad, right? And and and, 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 and the technology we're building will let companies um, do that, make them make their uh, advertisements. Uh, better and uh, maybe more fun to watch and more fun to, to, to look at. And uh, that's the way I see it. Okay, thanks. Uh, when we think about AI or, or metaverse, uh, we often have this expectation that something's going to get switched off immediately and it's essentially AI or we have metaverse right now. But I think in truth we have uh, a gradual process of going, of getting there, and things are becoming more AI or metaverse uh, in what we expect them to happen. Uh, Yash, what do you think? How far are we from that time where we can actually say, yes, this is the future we're living in right now? Um, I think it, 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 
somewhere we need to avoid the mistake that we did with social media in terms of business and consumer bridge. Because when social media was introduced, there was no formal education or even the introduction of how social media is different from kind of like conventional form of uh, communication uh, to the consumers, which actually led to uh, what I mentioned about these advertisements or predatory, predatory ad advertisers or businesses getting, uh, you know, just doing it for money because the consumers are not aware. When you talk about this AI right now, if you see when I buy a phone, uh, it says AI enabled camera, but it doesn't say what else is done in, with AI in, in the phone itself. So I think, uh, as, as I mentioned uh, in, in my uh, presentation, one of the seeds of innovation is the consumer, uh, consumer drive. So I think consumer awareness about AI would take, would take us in that direction where AI can become more of a part of our lives and there could be more uh, responsible application of AI in terms of from the business, from businesses, as well as uh, in terms of usage from from the consumers. And this also actually relates to what you said about inclusive ads uh, and what you was saying. Because uh, for, if you look at me, if you ask me, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, I don't find ads intrusive. intrusive. So we are going towards a sector where AI, machine learning, and these kind of technologies uh, would basically create a, a separate segment where either you pay for getting a service like YouTube Premium where you don't get ads at all, and uh, whereas uh, somebody who doesn't want to pay would be just okay with seeing advertisements which are uh, kind of related to them. So I think we are going in a direction where AI and these such technologies would, would create new market segments, whereas the current market segments will still be uh, existing for uh, for some of the consumers who just want to go away with things for free. Yes, yes, yes. If I may add, like, you brought a very interesting example with, with YouTube. Because on the one hand, you have the ads and the videos themselves, which are classical, intrusive, let's use that word, ads that, that work the same way as they would do on television. But then when you buy premium, those ads go away. That is not to say that advertising stops. Because with YouTube Premium, then YouTube wants you to buy YouTube Premium Plus which allows you to bring in more people or, or adds more things. And that is also advertising. And we need to extend our thinking, I'd say, from not only those classical media experiences where you see a picture and that's an ad, but towards uh, other ways of promoting services and things. And that is also a little bit in the games area. It's not only about advertising a brand in the game, but it's also about you purchasing additional characters for this game, or maybe in the future more game time, if, if so. That's, I think, a, a good example that you brought up. I would deem a, uh, an ad is successful when you are not incentivized to skip on it. So non-intrusive ads in games seem like the right way, the right direction to go, right? Because even if you purchase YouTube Premium, you still have those uh, creators that have sponsored content. You cannot see it on something that the creator is advertising in the movie itself. But uh, looking at the technology, how we are progressing in terms of converging uh, meta person universe, let's call it this way, I would think that maybe the next logical step is to have some sort of an API enabled for games. Like you said, uh, game development takes years in the case of cyberpunk, it's like Guns N' Roses Chinese democracy, it took like 20 years to create an album. The game itself is close in that direction as well. So obviously it's a long time spent, but if there was an API enabled to introduce maybe even targeted ads for a demographics that's playing a game in a certain region, it seems like a viable direction. Why don't we have it yet? We do. I want to say we have because it didn't really work, because it was still a classic form of delivering ads into games. So as a game developer, you could designate areas in your game, and in the future, a company that controls this particular square in the game can inject anything, and that's it. But we're coming back again to, to, to what we're saying. These are just billboards in the game. And considering the difficulties of measuring ad effectiveness in an open game environment, it's just not as attractive as having you 
directly by an ad, uh, an app, or a character in the game. It's just a different level of effectiveness, and it just hasn't caught on. But so we've been there, and we tested it just to do work. Carol, you see that uh, Iceberg did great work with System Zero, with already using eye tracking with devices. So again, why is it so important to go into the wild? Um, do we want to expand the analysis of the broader yeah. population? Yeah, so, so that actually came from iSquare. Uh, so we were approached, uh, approached some time ago to develop this uh, gaze estimation in the wild algorithm, specifically for mobile phones, because uh, the, the, the pieces of hardware that I showed in my presentation, those, um, eye tracker devices or, or eyewear, these are all um, uh, good for uh, laptops, desktops. And when it comes to mobile phones, where it, um, there, is only, there, there is not real alternative to that uh, because phones are much smaller, uh, the screens are much smaller, uh, so the accuracy um, uh, has to be higher for this kind of algorithm or system. And um, uh, really, uh, there was a really a need to develop something uh, innovative, um, something that has never been uh, done before or uh, hadn't been successful before. Uh, and that's why, that's why we took the challenge, because, um, because it required us to um, basically be on the bleeding edge of technology. That's where we are now with that. Amazing. Now my question to, to all of you guys. Um, Shisha, you said something about uh, brand awareness, like being exposed to a certain ad in a game, you did a test, there were uh, pretty renowned names like Technica Kankenkasse, Coca-Cola, but how do you introduce brands that are completely new to a user to a medium that this user is using as his main form of entertainment, games? Think about a 15-year-old kids that you want to introduce a brand uh, to. How do you do it? So a uh, very interesting question. Actually, an answer to this was at the very beginning of my presentation. I played this game that's called Snow Runner, and in this game you're a truck driver in Alaska, and you think, <laughs> "What sort of product can be sold to me?" But here's the thing: uh, it turns out that there are cheap industrial vehicles you can buy, uh, real world. Uh, truck companies advertise uh, their trucks in this game. You don't need to pay extra for them, they're just a part of it there. But I found myself suddenly being surprisingly knowledgeable about truck manufacturers and about actually there is Jeep's uh, latest just commercially available normal vehicle available in the game, aside from all the trucks. And it's just, it just works that way. And it's not a billboard for the truck. You can just buy it in the game and drive it. And I talked about the, the strength of advertising in games being in mimicry. It's the same vehicle that exists in the real world that you can go out and buy, and you can buy it in the game, and it's there. And it's not that it doesn't say for you to buy, you don't get anything extra, it's just there. And it works. And that's a nice example of sort of a, a, a delicate Inception. An inception type of type of thing. Uh, you, you can talk product placement. I mean, we saw this in movies for years and years. But here's a more of an interactive thing, and that's where that additional attention, I think, comes in that we can generate from the fact that the game is an interactive experience and not a passive experience where you just look at something and then you just move on. I think it just catches on differently if you can buy that car and drive in it. Stays with you. Like, hey, I drove the Jeep in that game yesterday. And uh, Carol, uh, can we expect? Can I add something to it? Of, of course, of course. So uh, uh, I'm a father of a, a teenager, and uh, so um, yeah. Uh, and, well, I'm a little gamer myself, but um, uh, my son really likes to play Fortnite, and I believe Fortnite is a great example of putting branding and commercials into a uh, um, otherwise free-to-play game. And, 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 and you, can, you can probably easily, we, we would probably uh, easily advertise DAC Digital if we put like a free skin for Fortnite with DAC Digital logo in it. And, 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 and guys would, would, would take it and, uh, 
Uh, if, you, if you put a free skin or, or an event in Fortnite, like teenagers will go crazy about it. And, uh, and that, that's, that's not a typical uh, sort of an ad. Like there, there are no banners or posters in Fortnite, but uh, things are advertised with skin tags or something like that, right? events. To be considered that can I add something to that? Uh, uh, recently we did a research about consumer uh, buying journey. So there are like five stages of it. So uh, what Chris uh, what just said and what he said was um, it relates to the first step of brand awareness. So uh, going to what you said about uh, unknown brand, uh, it would only be effective uh, from that uh, theory point of view if they come into contact with it from second source of ad. For instance, if I see something in a, in a video game, and if I follow it up with a conventional sort of, uh, say, ad that I see, then that kind of goes, uh, takes the consumer from the first step to the second step where they have keenness to, they have the brand awareness, they have the product awareness, and then they go on to that journey second, which could lead to the sales or the conversion part. So um, I, I would, according to what I know from the theory or what our experiment results show, that if it is just one ad in the game or in any form where the brand is not known, then it will not be effective. You need to follow it up with something conventional as well. Or you know, when I if I if I uh, drive a truck and then I say, oh, this is the same truck that I saw in the game. Now that takes me to like second or third level where I would be more prone to buy that product. So the effectiveness of the advertising will actually depend on how it is followed up rather than just the place. Yeah. Uh, it's a mimicry. Uh, again, uh, and that's a very well pointed out that, that it works one way. Yeah. It works better if this product already exists. I think it will be much more challenging to create a virtual brand and then try to bring it back. But we've seen this in the past, right? I think in the TV show Breaking Bad, there was a brand called Polo Yoko, right? And eventually, it became such a strong part of the culture that they spawned it into a physical location, right? So we can we can have this sort of inception going from the virtual into the real, right? Yeah, because there are like, if you look at Pokemon Go, for example, it was just a cartoon, but then the popularity was so much that it led to a development of uh, a real world uh, product which actually sold even better than the cartoon itself. So sometimes it could lead from virtual to real, but I mean it has to become, it has to just go viral in terms of people accepting it. Because, like for instance, you mentioned that BSC gives a free uh, screen to a teenager. Uh, okay, if we consider that okay, we are having a line of toys that BSC is developing which, uh, which they can buy, but then that has to be followed up, it, it wouldn't like directly convert into uh, something that would generate revenue for the company itself, so the effectiveness part would be different. I just want to check in. <laughs> Interesting point you brought up. Pokemon actually first a computer game. Yeah. Created by Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, you might mean. It might be sense. Yeah. 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 And then a cartoon, and then the rest, as you said. So but it's actually. Been happening. Yeah. Sorry, this has been happening like cartoon to video game or video game to cartoon. This transition is very common, but the transition of going from a cartoon to something which is an actual product, not just card, because there have been other cartoons where you collect cards, um, which are quite expensive sometimes, but an actual uh, say virtual reality game, uh, which is just based on the cartoon or a product that you will buy to play something, because you, the cartoon was very popular, it's something which kind of leads, you know, you, you have something in your hand, and then you are more associated or you're more attached to that brand rather than just like looking at that. Yes. Yeah, um, but no, my question actually was, um, I guess it's connected to everything everyone was saying, but I also played Fortnite, and I actually feel like, um, you know, what you said earlier, I hate advertisements on Facebook and Instagram. I'm always just like, ugh. But I actually love them on Fortnite because it makes me sort of feel more in reality. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. So I more with the brand. Yeah, I was just going to say that I connect actually like more with the brand when I'm in this better universe because I'm like, it's more real now. So that's, that was my comment about the data you presented. Like that people who are playing games probably don't like advertisement. I don't know, I was kind of like, I love them. Yeah. So there is one more thing I have. I'm 
that you do English conversation sometimes with the, for, for the last four years with a kid. He is uh, about seven, eight years old right now, and he also plays Fortnite. And the reason why he develops his players is so that he can sell it. So, the, the, you know, you see, again, we go back to this that you have an advertisement, you develop something virtual, but then you have something, uh, in, uh, the implication in the real world. So, the whole ecosystem of the effectiveness or the feeling that I, uh, my privacy is being intruded kind of goes away, and then we love those yes. advertisements because we can gain something in the real world. The reason why I stopped playing video game was like, I need to do like race Formula One cars around the circuit, and I'm going to win this world championship, and then what? Yeah. I mean, then I just reset the game and play again. So I don't, I waste my time in the real world. So that was the feeling that I got. But if I would probably win a world championship and then I, I can cash it, oh, then that makes it uh, a real world connection. We have more questions? Yeah. Just about my follow up with that, since this is the art, technology, and science conference, is what about this idea now that artists can create characters um, and advertise them in games and have people buy them? in the digital world. Yeah, this, this is what I was referring yeah. to, like developing this. But I, I read this morning the, this, uh, I mean, I'm not very well versed in NFTs, but the NFT market dropped like significantly in the past, uh, say, say, a month or a half month. It was like 90% drop or something. So it's like, we don't know whether this connection will keep on going or how long it's going to sustain or is it just a bubble. Just uh, an interesting side note to, to what you asked. Of course, uh, now we have something that's called the ND game scene, and these are games created by single people who are able to create a complete game. But also, there's a darker side to all of this. There's a whole industry that uses AI to generate fake games, which are then being sold on App Store or on Steam, and they basically steal assets from games, the availability of tools is so great, it's easy to hook up on an AI engine and then it just creates a hundred games, just like they're AI generating video for kids, which are just nonsense, but they have these, these images, you can do the same thing for games. For example, Sorry, can I just have one <laughs> Okay, I don't know, it's like just coincidence about discussions that happen. Yesterday, uh, Radek uh, and I were having a discussion about what brings in the night, and we have been discussing about this uh, blogs of how we can write more effective blogs in marketing, and now we have AI, which is writing super blogs. So recently, it, it might be interesting to, uh, maybe I don't know if you know this, Google uh, basically updated its algorithm. Now it has an AI to detect AI-generated articles so it can be excluded from the search engine algorithm. So uh, I think what is going to what happens when we develop one technology? We already have the like a positive and a negative to cancel it out. So I think in this case also, if, they, if uh, there are some AI characters being developed, then there will be some AI to detect if that is AI developed characters. Yeah? So here, human emotions would probably play 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 a big role. Like you know, in the I think it was Australian Open where Rafael Nadal was like deemed to have. AI said that he can never win it, but in the end, he was the one who won it. So it took 90, percent, 90 plus percent possibility that he will lose, and then in the end, he actually won it. So the human element or the emotion factor would, uh, is something probably that would negate that. Yeah, I wanted to, to add my perspective because I find this is a very interesting discussion because I don't have anything to do with games at all. And for me, it was always like, oh yeah, those games, they exist, <laughs> yeah. And it's very interesting to see all of that. And I was so amazed that coincidentally yesterday, uh, last week, I saw a, a, a thing um, on recent developments of in, uh, app purchases, in game purchases, you also talked about. And already now in Germany, it's a multi billion dollar industry, and I wasn't aware of that. And I thought, okay, there's probably some 10 people somewhere in Germany buying stuff for, I don't know, Candy Crush, but no. It's a massive industry, and it's very interesting to talk about that. I think there was a case of a, uh, like a kid in Germany buying so many cards on FIFA that he actually was in debt for 20,000 euros because he kept on buying cards. <laughs> and I was like, wow, people are really spending that amount of money. And uh, I wanted to ask one basic question because as a kid, I remember playing FIFA like one year maybe. Those ads we see on the, uh, actually, I don't know what it's called, the pitch surrounding the pitch. Yeah. Surrounding the pitch were they real ads even back then? In, you saw you saw the picture of FIFA ninety three. Panasonic. Panasonic was the first one. Panasonic has. Yeah, they were uh, real, but the difference was 
the game developers had to ask for permission. They had to ask that was something, can we put your logo in? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I thought as a kid, I always thought, okay, did they just copy the ones that are like the actual World Cup maybe to make it look more realistic? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like absolutely, they copied it, they had to ask for it. And uh, it's an interesting point with car games also. So I mentioned that uh, in the car games, uh, companies would not give uh, rights uh, because they just didn't find attractive, and in some cases, companies had to pay money. Also, even up to until today, in many games or in most games, you can't actually damage cars if they are real cars. Those games still don't allow you to crash, crash a car. You can drive into a wall, it will be invincible. So there. But, but in that sense, it's just like the, the real app market, right? It's brand safety, stuff like that, so it seems like natural dynamics continue to apply. Apparently. Yes, exactly. But, but coming back to your question, yes, they had to ask, and that was the reality in the 90s, and nobody was paying game developers money for putting ads into games. They wanted those ads in the games because they wanted to copy uh, reality as much as they could. You know, you talk about ads, but if you talk about players or athletes itself, so, so for instance, if there is a, say, Formula 1 2020 new uh, game comes out, the, the drivers basically sign a contract with Formula 1 so that their name can be used in the game and they get paid for it. Whereas previously it was, a, it was like a competition of, oh, can you please put my name in the game? So I think it's, it's uh, like something but in the, in the reverse way, you know? Where people want, uh, athletes want to be present in the game so that people will know them. And now it's like the other way around that if you only use my name, you pay me. So. So I guess it's a question of creating an ecosystem where we have smarter, not more pushy ads. No longer ad box for 12 minutes an hour, but maybe a support or some form of introducing brands and brand awareness that is less intrusive in context, exactly. Do we have uh, four questions from the audience? Yes, I like. Just for you, Foucault and Carlo, uh, what about case est estimation? In games or using case uh, for enhancing uh, game uh, games. So if you use your hands to play, but what about using your eyes? To yeah, play? Uh, uh, that's that's a really interesting topic. Uh, people are um, working on that as we speak. So there are um, there are um, uh, examples of uh, or or, or, or uh, yeah, examples of. Adoption case estimation into the games. I mentioned during my presentation. I mentioned the, the driving game uh, example. Right, so you drive a car, uh, but you want to look around and you, you use your gaze. But there are other ways. Uh, you, you have a shooter game, in which you uh, run with a gun. Right, but, um, uh, maybe your eye is definitely faster than your hands or your fingers. So if you could control your character with your eyes, uh, or at least your gun with your eyes. Maybe that would be uh, a more uh, immersive experience. That's that's one idea. Uh, another idea is like um, uh, all of those flight simulator games or, or like space simulator games. Uh, again, using your gaze to look around your cockpit uh, seems like a natural way to do it, right? If you uh, and if you um, um, expand your, your setup with several monitors. Right, placed around you, you could have like super, uh, super realistic uh, way of uh, like experiencing a flight or uh, car drive, something like that. Is there any chance that in the next five to ten years, case estimation will actually uh, take over VR and AR? Right. Yeah. So, like I said, I, I've heard this story before at Intel with uh, uh, with hand gestures control. So everyone was saying it's, it's in in the next three years everyone is gonna control your, your laptop with your hands. I don't know how it's gonna be with gaze estimation. Maybe it will work. Maybe we'll see more of that. I would I would uh, uh, keep attention to this coffee company. They they seem to collaborate with Ubisoft, for example. Right, Ubisoft has a vast uh, library of games. They're 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 teaming up with Toby apparently to uh, include case estimation features into their games. 
let's see what, how, how that works. Um, so uh, I, I guess we're about to see. It's hard to tell now. Can I just add one thing? Because he mentioned that when he was giving the presentation, he mentioned this about you know uh, using gaze estimation to see if the driver is looking on the phone or not. So here it's a very uh, good. Yesterday I was driving to Gdansk and I saw that uh, I was driving this big car. And if you when you're passing a car, there, on the mirror in the modern cars you have this light which shows away that you know there is a car passing by, but most of the time people don't even look in the mirror. Now, if you consider this upgrade of putting the car, it becomes like shallow tech, but gaze estimation can make it deep tech by ensuring that the driver cannot change the lane until unless the driver actually looks on the side of the mirror. And there are a lot of accidents uh, that happen because of that. And it, it kind of uh, moves on from just adapting digital technology to making it effective in terms of solving uh, problems of accidents just because people don't look in their uh, side mirrors before working. And um, I, I can add one, one more use case uh, related to that, that with this attention or um, uh, attention tracking. So uh, I know that there are uh, research going, uh, there is research going on um, uh, to use gaze estimation for uh, remote schooling. So COVID is now, uh, the pandemic is gone, but um, it may turn out that uh, we will need to get back to remote schooling. And one of the issues back then was that uh, teachers were, uh, it was hard for teachers to, to keep students' attention. And, and, and there were research going on to like inform the, te inform the teacher when he's giving a lecture uh, if, uh, if students are actually paying attention to the lecture, are they looking at the screen or are they looking in totally different directions. So uh, there are also other ways to use these estimations. I just want to add, I heard about this, I also know that students very quickly devised ways of cheating the system. <laughs> Actually, in Poland, uh, the law says that you cannot uh, ask a student, even during the final end exam uh, examination, to turn on their cameras. So, I, I mean, it, it wouldn't work if, uh, if the cameras came out, it would be turned off, basically, you know, that stuff. And, uh, <laughs> So with the students, they always find more way, ways of doing it. So it's, they're not, not looking in the camera, so you will not be able to get it. Oh, how often it hurts. My camera is not working, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I have a question. Would it, would it, how would the privacy look like if we take this scenario that the cameras cannot be turned on, but can the gaze estimation be enforced to turn on from the privacy point of view? Not the current uh, software stack we're developing, but um, like, I can imagine uh, things like um, like embedding this kind of feature uh, inside of a uh, piece of hardware that you have in your laptop or your phone, and so it's it's actually hardware restrict restricted by hardware to uh, pass that video stream somewhere else, so nobody sees that. But your phone is not. It can be aware of the fact that you're looking at your at the screen or you're not looking at the screen, and then so that's uh, like um, it's less privacy intrusive, I would say, because that information doesn't go out of the um, out of the out of your phone. Like it's only used uh, uh, inside it, right? Um, and, and this can be harder um, uh, hard, harder enforced in, in some way. So does it mean that in the future we'll not be able to turn the phone in a protest upside down when there's a net running? I'll be forced to consume it before I even move onwards? <laughs> yeah, you cannot turn off uh, YouTube music if you don't have the premium version. If you turn off the screen, you basically turn off the thing as well. So we have got an example of that. So to create an ecosystem where people are not angry because of that is to go into a smart way, more in context way with content consumed consumption. It will always be a balance of putting the ad uh, or the message for you to perform some action in the correct context. And the feedback we always get in the gaming research is that the most important thing is that ad, that whatever you're asking needs to be in context, in the correct context for it to work. And that rule is going to be always with us. 
So the convergence of data that we get from social media that content we consume, content we produce, can be then uh, linked with the games we play and through potential APIs in the future, a targeted ad for me as a user, as a consumer, can be positioned there to be more of spot on. I think we're all already there. Excellent. Do we have any more questions? If not, I would say we can conclude that part of the